I am tremendously honored and excited to get to be here on this significant day, the fifth birthday of Creative Mornings in Helsinki, which serves as a reminder for all of us of how far we've come as a creative community, but a mid-celebration, a reminder of the road ahead. Today, I argue that creatives are needed more than ever because the world's complex problems keep growing, both in number and intensity. And the survival of our species and that of the planet depends on the development of creative solutions to these problems. And these solutions are brought to life by you, me, and the creative collective around the globe. Therefore, I want to thank Johannes for running this Helsinki branch for the past five years. And I want to thank all of you for joining us this morning to together discuss about how to harness our creative capacity to solve the complex problems of today. So I want to start with a personal exercise. That's why you have the pen and paper there. And write down an answer to this question. I know that this would potentially be a more interesting and meaningful question, but I think it's a bit too early to go that deep into our existence. So I'm asking you, why are you here taking part in this session? So write down your answer. It can be a goal. What are you going to, look, uh, to take away of this session? What brought you here? So we're going to use uh, one to two minutes for you to come up with an answer. And I will value your privacy, so you don't need to share it. It's just for you. Okay, someone is still finishing and that's totally fine, but I see that most of you, you already came up with an answer. Well, this goal is likely to frame your role as a participant in this session. If your goal is to enjoy a nice morning with a, with a good cup of coffee, a tea and, and the nice cakes, meet some colleagues you haven't seen after summer and potentially learn something new about an interesting topic, you might take the role of an attentive listener. However, if your goal is to confront the speaker based on her previous tweets, that has happened as well, or someone in the audience, you might take the role of an active challenger. And most of you are situated somewhere between these two. Why this is important is that whatever role you take for this session, for the next hour, it will define your attitude, attention and actions for, for our upcoming session. This is important because according to research, the role we choose to play, whether this morning or more generally in our lives, it will inevitably affect our subsequent attitude, attention and actions. And what is the challenge here in terms of sustainability? Well, our current actions and our current solutions, they tend to build on old roles rather than questioning them or proposing new ones. By this I mean that we are drawing our solutions from our existing attention, attitudes and actions which might hinder us from seeing the new things on the horizon, which you as creatives know that will undoubtedly hold back our creativity. So we need to shake up our role thinking and come up with a new role how to be in relation with the world that is currently facing the sustainability crisis. E-cigarette is a great or a terrible example of this. It is a solution that was based, built on the role, old role understanding of a smoker. What we see today, unfortunately too much, is that we are creating the e-cigarettes of sustainability. We are creating less harmful solutions by making a tiny bit of greener products. We are making small improvements to our existing business models or our existing operating systems. 
But unfortunately, these are not bringing the radical changes we need to our system. These are only bringing incremental change. And none of this is not enough to solve the wicked problems of sustainability. What I mean by wicked problems is illustrated here. Most of our problem solving as humans, as problem solvers, is targeted to conventional problem solving. Conventional problem solving means problems that are fairly easy to define, also fairly easy to solve based on our prior experience, statistical method and conventional um, probability counting. However, wicked problems look more like this. They are messy, they are complex, they are interdependent, they happen over decades and they go across global borders. Wicked problems are hard to define and they are even harder to solve. If we think about climate change or resource depletion, biodiversity loss, poverty, hunger, increasing polarization or inequality, all of those are wicked problems and that's why we are having such a hard time in solving them. Wicked problems are not going to be solved by small improvements on the existing system or on the ex by the existing practices and they are not going to be solved by small incremental improvements and change but they need transformative change which is brought forward by sustainability transitions. I don't know how many in the audience are familiar with the concept of sustainability transitions. There are a few nodding, but, but mostly not. The word is relatively new, and it was made more widely known by the IPCC climate report published on October 2018. Sustainability transitions mean fundamental, systemic, societal level changes through which different sectors, such as energy or transportation <coughs> or food system, go through and shift from one regime to another towards more sustainable modes of production and consumption. I know this is very much like research, researcher kind of talk, and it is a, a research field on its own, started in Netherlands about two or three decades ago. But I will bring it more, more down to practice what it, what it means. We are seeing these sustainability transitions already. Unfortunately, not at the blistering pace and depth we might assume or at least hope for, but, but some of these are already happening. We see energy sector moving from centralized fossil fuel-based energy sources towards more decentralized renewable sources of energy. We see transportation sector moving from combustion engine cars to electric vehicles. And hopefully in the future we will see air traveling being replaced by traveling in virtual reality. So these are the big fundamental societal level changes that we need in order to tackle the sustainability challenges. My work as a researcher is grounded in this field, in sustainability transitions. More specifically, I'm, I'm just finishing my PhD in the business school in Tampere University about the role of companies in instigating and speeding up such transitions. Because we're today focusing on the concept of roles, I pulled a list here of some other roles that I recognize myself carrying in my current life. So I also teach, speak and advise companies in how they could reframe their own role of being in relation with the world that is facing the sustainability challenges. As Johannes mentioned, I previously worked as a community organizer in Love Foundation Helsinki, which was trying to come up with ways how to bring sustainability transitions forward on a grassroots level through the means of arts and creative uh, culture. And every day I play the role of an active consumer citizen and try to find ways of how to make a small impact on my daily actions. 
One of my daily actions is active reading. And I want to ask if anyone in the audience has come up with Tim Urban's Wait But Why block. OK, few hands. I'm happy for you guys. I'm also happy for you guys who haven't, because you still have the opportunity to experience that Ave-inspiring moment when you get to read his writings for the first time. This is, I can see you nodding who have, who have done that. So this is definitely something that I recommend you to, to do this weekend. Uh, this guy is just brilliant. Earlier this week, Tim started a new series of writing where he focuses on exploring society and how society works and how we as people, as individuals, operate and act as part of it. His illustration was so good, so I wanted to share it with you because it sort of gives uh, more input on, on this idea of rethinking and reframing our own role. So, this here is society. Let's zoom in on its left arm. A little bit further. Can you see those two bumps here on the elbow? Let's zoom in on the bottom one. There, see me, come closer. Hi, that's me, that's you. We are single cells in society's body. Well, how we all probably would like society to look like is this, a well-behaved grown-up. However, more often than not, society in reality looks more like this. <laughs> Personally, I'm not as pessimistic about the current state of society as Tim is. But as I mentioned in the beginning of my talk, there is a growing consensus that we are facing the current threat of sustainability crisis. Most likely, many of us encounter headlines and news like this every day. Most recently, the ones about Amazon forest fires destroying the, the green heart of our planet. But what I am more interested in about as a researcher is this, that we are also every day encountered by the potential change makers, meaning you, me, and us all together. So this is another time when you need your pen and paper. So similar manner, as I wrote down my own roles on my presentation slide, just come up with three to five roles you can identify for yourself as part of society. And again, it's a personal exercise, so you're not going to be asked to share them. Okay, most of you have finished. Other ones, you can still continue. How many of you have a role there that is related to your profession? Many of you. How many in this room work in a company? Some of you. In an organization? Yes. How many of you are entrepreneurs? Oh, wow. Usually we don't get this much hands. Great. NGO. An NGO, absolutely. I consider that as an organization as well. Okay. Yes. And how many of you here are um, customers of a company or an organization? All you are. Congratulations, you really are the change makers. As I mentioned, my own research work is is based on the role of companies in mobilizing, speeding up these transitions that we talk. Why I'm focusing on companies is that currently in a globalized marketplace, companies are the ones who are having a great power to influence how we as consumers as behave and how the market behaves and how 
the future direction for our society and ecosystem looks like. In my research, I argue that companies are the key actors in initiating sustainability transitions. They hold the first class resources, they have the financial means to do so, they have the networks, they have the collaboration with NGOs, with, uh, with other organizations. And as I said, they have the omnipresent footprint at the globalized marketplace. None of these transitions would be possible without the innovative front-runner companies. It is said that private business actors are the source of innovative solutions in our society. This is the first of the two more theoretical slides, I promise. But I, ar I argue that this is important to understand for all of those who work in a company or who act in their everyday life as a customer of a company. Because you both have an influence, influence to have an effect on where that company, where our companies are moving. Most of the companies are uh, divided on based on these uh, three distinctions here. Some companies we still see operating here, where they see that they are a separate part of society and environment, and they can only focus on making business for themselves and for their own profits. They might have some sustainability initiatives included, which are required by legislation or their key stakeholders, but they are not proactive in this at all. We call this as business as usual. I would argue that most of the companies in Finland are somewhere here. They recognize the overlap already with the society and with the environment. And they are implementing changes. This could mean that they are changing their materials to, to less resource intensive. They are looking for more sustainable energy solutions, or they are implementing more equal recruitment policies. But this we call as change as usual. The focus is still on the business itself. This is where we should go, and where we are going if we look at those companies who are rethinking, reframing their role. These companies use their core business and the scale advantages it offers to improve the state of society and that of the wider ecosystem. This we call as business as a transformative force for good. These companies understand that when they reframe their role in relation to sustainability, they are actually reframing obligation as opportunity. This is the second more theoretical slide, and it's, it's the con concluding figure of my dissertation. Obviously, it's not easy for companies to, to move from a worldview built on here. It's not e even easy to move here, let alone to move here. You need to get the whole company or the whole organization with you. It needs to start from the top, but you need everyone in the, in the bottom as well to come there with you. You need all your collaborators, your stakeholders. You need to change your whole business model, so it's not easy. But in my research, I, I tried to find ways for how companies could actually do this. I call this as a reframing cube, and as you uh, probably were quick to notice, it is uh, getting its inspiration from the Rubik's Cube. The idea here is that all these elements are interconnected that companies need to consider, but the right solution to a company or an organization looks different based on the purpose of that company, its business model, its business environment. But these elements need to be taken into account. 
So we need to think about sustainability in a strategic area, in a tactical area, and in an operational area. Usually sustainability is only th thought about here, at the operational area, how we start to recycle in our office. How that reframing happens, it is that we need to rethink our business strategies, integrate sustainability as core part of the strategy. We need to change our management. Many times when I consult companies, I ask if they have sustainability as any kind of key performance indicator in their, in their management policies. And guess what? 99% don't have. So we need to change our management activities and start to manage that transition. And also we need to rethink our co-creation practices. No matter how innovative company, it's not going to do this by itself. It needs to co-create these solutions together with its customers, current or potential ones, together with uh, other stakeholders, research institutes, NGOs, non-profits, charity organizations. It needs to come together with all of those who are influenced one way or another, directly or indirectly, by the current challenges that they are going to tackle. And they need to understand that sustainability does not only mean economic sustainability, it also means environmental sustainability and social sustainability. Currently, we are probably seeing too many companies putting their effort on economic sustainability. And in the political conversation, I would argue that we are now focusing quite a lot on the environmental sustainability side. Social sustainability is an equal part of this. We are not going to achieve any of those dimensions of sustainability without the other. So the Rubik's Cube brings all these together, but then it is given to the company or the organization to let them solve it, how it looks like for them. And what I'm hopeful about is that when they find the solution, they are able to bring changes on the production and consumption sites on their business environment that will help shift the whole industry towards sustainability. If this sounds abstract, I can again give some examples. I'm, I'm sorry I couldn't find a, an English uh, headline about this company yet. But we have a Finnish company who is trying to solve the food problem of the world by creating food, protein to be precise, of air. Tesla Motors, we can think differently about Elon Musk, but it is a company who started the transition towards electric vehicles. That one we can probably uh, admit. Currently, Stura Enzo and Sulapak, a Finnish startup, they team up for biodegradable straws. Vegan burger maker Beyond Meat is really driving the growth for other vegan meat producers. And it is changing the food industry. When we talk about energy solutions, we cannot trust anymore that those energy source uh, solutions will come from the, from the government, will come from the um, entrenched institutions that have been playing a huge role in how we have been used to consume energy in our society today. We have innovative companies who are rethinking the whole energy system and bringing decentralized solutions for renewable energy. So this is maybe my key message of the speech, that reframing our role in relation to sustainability as individuals here and as part of those companies we work for or that we are customers of can be the key for innovative solutions and sustainability transitions as reframing as a process opens up new ways of thinking organizing and doing. That way it has the potential 
to change the culture, structures and practices through which we journey through this adventure called life. I have the one last task for you to use your pen and paper. So pick one of those roles that you listed earlier, mark it somehow, underline it, and think about one action that you can do through that role to advance sustainability already this weekend. I want to make it that concrete. Okay, some of you are still in the middle of it. It's hard, I can tell. It's not easy, because we need to rethink our roles. However, consider this paper now as your love letter to the sustainable future of the planet and its species. And make sure that you send it. Because it's not enough that we talk about sustainability. One must believe in it. And it's not enough that we believe in it. We must work at it. So let, let us work at it together, starting now. Thank you.